won the Olympic decathlon gold medal and broke the world decathlon record, earning the title of the world's greatest athlete. He became a broadcaster, one of America's most sought after inspirational speakers and part of the now extraordinarily famous Kardashian family. In 2015, this exceptional person captured the world's attention again when she revealed her true self, Caitlyn Jenner, and was honored with the Arthur Ashe Award for Courage for her transition from Olympic athlete to transgender activist. She, ex she executive produced I Am Kate, the landmark television series documenting her post-transition life. She partnered with MAC Cosmetics to donate over 1.3 million to transgender initiatives. She was named Barbara Walters' most fascinating person of the year and honored as one of the Glamour magazine's Women of the Year. Last year, Caitlin shared her story in her New York Times best-selling memoir, The Secrets of My Life, co-authored with Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Buzz Bissinger. She is here today to share that story with us. Caitlin is going to talk for about 20 minutes, and then she and I will have a conversation on stage with some questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage Caitlin Jenner. Thank you, Fiona. See you up here in a minute. Thank you, Fiona. It was a pleasure. We met earlier, and it's a pleasure to meet you. I just want to say, I'm standing here in front of you, a free soul. It was a long journey to get to this point. But after years and years of wondering, oh my God, can I live my life authentically? And all the challenges that go along with that, with society, with my family, with my faith, with everything, can I do this? Finally, after so many years of struggling with it, I finally came to the decision that yes, this issue has come forward. We have moved this issue forward. Maybe I can be part of the voice. My journey started many, many years ago. I remember I've been in the speaking business for like 40 years. I've been doing it a long time. And I would stand up on stage, and I would look out all over the audience, and I'd be talking about the Olympics, and I'm talking about overcoming you know, the, the competitive edge that you had to deal with and pressure that you had to deal with and all these other issues. And I was standing up in front of the audience and as I was talking, underneath my suit, I had a bra and pantyhose on, okay? Nobody knew, okay? But I figured I could get away with it because I had a suit over top and nobody knew what was under it. And as I would look out over the audience, I would think to myself, these people know nothing about me, about my journey, about my struggle, about who I am. All I ever talked about for 40 years was this 48 hours in my life when I was in the Olympic Stadium. Great speech, a lot of fun to do, but there was so much more to me than just that. And I would stand there, and I would think, would I ever have the opportunity to tell my story? I would walk off the stage and feel like a fraud. Felt like I left my audience and didn't tell them everything about me. I, in honesty, and because I want to be honest in this, I just want to say, I do have a brown panty hose underneath this. Okay, so, so, so at least we can start there. My journey has been a long journey. It is so great that I have an opportunity to come and to speak to you today. Because gender identity, trans issues, and everything, there are no borders. There are trans people in every country of the world. It is part of humanity. Now, it's so tough for people to understand really what it is. Honestly, I never understood it my entire life. I struggled with it. What is it? Am I this? Am I that? Why are these thoughts in my head? So I do a couple little ways to try to explain it. One, I'm going to ask the women, and we can ask the men too, but a very simple, I'll kind of stick to the women. 
Okay, a very simple question. And it's a simple question that probably nobody has ever asked you before. But I want you to take a minute, just a few minutes, and for the guys, I want you guys to take just a few minutes and just think about it and think about the question. And this simple little question is, when did you know you were a girl? For the guys, when did you know you were a guy? Seems like every time I ask that question, especially to the ladies, I look at the audience, and all of a sudden, you can tell it. They get into deep thought about, wait a second, when did I know I was a girl? A very simple question. But for those, that 30 seconds, this is what a trans person goes through. It has nothing to do with sexuality. It has nothing to do with anything. It has to do with gender and about who you are as a person. And for a trans person, that goes through your head 24 hours a day, 365 days out of the year. You can't, like, take two aspirin and get plenty of sleep, wake up the next morning, and you're fine. That question is in your head constantly. Who am I? Now, every journey is different. Obviously, mine was very different. And they ask the question, why? You know, here I am with a group of doctors, and boy, you know, it's wonderful. And, you know, why they try to make it why are some people trans, some people not trans, on and on and on. And to be honest with you, for the last three years, I've asked so many times, so many questions about what the issues are, this and that, and is there a reason for all of this? And nobody can, can really come up with a good reason. A good example is this. How many people in the room are right-handed? Raise your hand. Right-handed. Eh, see the majority right-handed. Okay. How many people are left-handed? Yeah, I'm left-handed, yes, okay, my people are out there, my pe but not too many of them, okay? But I don't know, for a lot of, especially the older ones in the groups, um, when I was growing up, okay, back in the 50s and 60s, a lot of times, now fortunately it wasn't for me, the teachers would say, look it, we live in a right-handed world. You got to learn. I was left-handed. You got to learn to write with your right hand. I mean, the desks in school were this little arm came up like this and came around. So for right-handers, me, the poor left-hander, my elbow's going off the side. So you know, the teacher would say, "You ha you have to learn how to write with your right hand." And so, of course, like any person, you know, listening to their elders, they would say, okay, I'm going to learn to write with my right hand. So you get that pen and you put it in your right hand and you're going to conform to society and you start writing. The penmanship is not that good, but you learn to do it. You learn to play the game. Finally, at some point in your life, you go, wait a second. I have always felt better with the pen in my left hand and writing that way. I'm not going to listen to everybody else. I'm going to be myself. And all of a sudden, you start writing with the, right, with the left hand. And the penmanship is better. The words flow better. They come out of your head. On and on. It's just who you are. And there's no good reason for it. It's just who you are. My journey was obviously very different. I struggled with many, many different things. I remember the day after the game, since we brought it up, earlier. The next morning I woke up after I just won the games the day before. Broke the world record and had a good, oh, but that, enough about that. But anyway, enough about me. And I woke up the next morning and I walk into the bathroom, didn't have a stitch of clothes on. And I look on the counter and there's the medal. So I take the medal and I put the medal on and I look into the mirror. And I'm looking into the mirror and saying, oh my God, what did I just do? Did I build this character up, Bruce Jenner, so big that I'm stuck with him for the rest of my life because it's really not me? And I got scared. 
It wasn't like this exciting moment. I thought, oh my God, I'm stuck with this guy for the rest of my life. It's really not me, but I'm going to have to play this game until the day I die. It was actually very, very difficult on me at first. But immediately I found a job. I kind of dove into life. Bruce kind of dove into life. Raising a family, working, learning the television business, learning the speaking business, you name it, go on and on and on. Started immediately, started raising a family. I am very blessed. I have 10 wonderful children between biological kids and, and stepkids. I've been very blessed through my life. I said, I, you know, with kids, how you get in trouble. I said, they were a great diversion, you know, work, all these other things I didn't have to think about myself. And of course, I got in trouble when I said that with the family. Oh, is that all we were, is a diversion? And I go, no, 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 okay. You weren't the diversion. It was a diversion to, from who I was. But that's pretty much how I survived all those years. But this question in my head never goes away. Years and years go by. I worked. I raised a family. I did everything. And all of a sudden, now all my kids are raised. They're all out doing very well. I wind up back in Malibu, where I had sat inside of a house for almost six years because I never felt like I fit in anywhere. All by myself. My kids are all raised. What am I going to do with my life? The tabloids were going crazy. I'd have four or five cars following me everywhere I went, taking pictures. I was out running them through the hills. I was doing everything to get away. They were writing every stupid story you could possibly come up with in the media, putting my face on some woman's body on the cover of Us magazine, on and on and on. And I thought to myself, what am I going to do with my life? Got back into therapy, which I had been in therapy many times throughout my life. Thank God for a good mental, mental people out there that can help in the mental issues that we have and give good therapy to people. And I was fortunate I had great people. And I thought, okay, first I have to talk to all my children. They all knew something, you know, they all knew. I mean, I'm on the cover of magazines and my, all my kids are in the public eye. But it was the subject that we never talked about. So finally, one at a time, I didn't want to bring all 10 over. They're going to gang up on me, so I think I better do this one at a time. So I brought over each kid. First one I brought over was my son, Brandon. Brandon and I have always been very, very close. Brandon and my family, he, he writes music, he's a musician, he's, he's kind of like our little Gandhi in the family. He just gets it and he's out there. So I'm sitting there, starting with him and his wife Leah, and we started talking about all of this stuff. And finally, near the end of our conversation, he says to me, he goes, you know what? I have been so proud that you have been my father. He says, if I go to the airport and I hand him my ID, they always will say, oh, is Bruce Jenner your dad? And always, they always say very nice things about you and about who you are, what you've accomplished in your life. She says, I've always been so proud to be your son. But I've never been more proud of you than I am right now. When he told me that, I thought, you know what? I think it's going to be OK. We both cried over it and on and on. And slowly, since I went through all 10 children, I was able to convince him that this is the right thing to do. Sure, they scared. Of course, I'm scared. I don't know what's going to happen, but I am getting destroyed in the tabloids. I am a person of faith. The next person I had to talk to was my pastor after I got through all the kids. I have sat there in church and listened to sermons, and I would always sitting there in my head asking the question, God, why? Why is this in my head and I can't get rid of it? 
Is there a reason for this? Am I doing a good job when I get up there to the pearly gates and I sit down in front of them and I say, did I do everything right? Did I do everything right? I didn't know what the answer was. So I invited my pastor over and he kind of knows what's going on because of the tabloids and we sit down and we talk about faith and about who we are as a person. That night, I laid in bed and I thought to myself, you know what? Maybe at this point in my life that maybe this is the reason God put me on this earth. To number one, live your life authentically. The most important thing. To be able to know in your heart and your soul that this is the right thing to do and for my family. And in two, in doing that, can I make a difference? Can I bring this issue forward? There was other trans people because when I was young, nobody knew anything about it. When I was young, I didn't even know a name for it. But now, many years later, over the last 10 years, this issue has come forward. We have people in the United States like Laverne Cox and Janet Mock and a lot of people who have come through and been very good in the public eye. Maybe I should add my voice to this conversation. And it was kind of the last hurdle I had to get over in my life about my, as well as my faith to bring this issue forward. Now becomes the question, once I finally decided, oh my God, this is so scary, but once I finally decided, how do you do it? How do you pull this thing off? The first person I called, this good friend of mine, a guy named Alan Nirob. Alan is my was my PR guy all the way back in the 80s. And back in the 80s, the New York Times was going to write an article that I was a cross-dresser. And Alan was my uh, kind of just the beginning of his career in the PR business. So I had to bring my lawyer in, my manager at the time, and Alan, and kind of tell him my story. So for the last 35 years, Alan has known my story. I didn't even know where he was anymore. He was originally at this PR group in Los Angeles called Rogers and Cowan. I thought, well, I'll start there. I'll call there. So I look, call information, call up Rogers and Cowan, and uh, ask for Alan Nirob. And they say, just one minute. I go, oh my God, I can't believe he's still there. Anyway, I find out now he's president of Alan Ro Rogers and Cowan. And I said, Alan, you got to come out to the house. And he had seen the tabloid stories and all this stuff for years. He comes out to the house that Saturday. And we sat down and we started figuring, trying to figure out, okay, how can we do this in a way? Right now, because of the tabloids and the issues and all the rumors surrounding me, I'm way down here. I don't deserve to be down there. I deserve to be up here. I deserve this issue. And the trans people and the people that are suffering from gender dysphoria, this is up here. They're good people. They deserve better. So how can I take this issue out of the gutter and go up there? And we thought, well, let's start off with, I thought the best person, most credible person, was Diane Sawyer, ABC News. This is a news story. It's not a tabloid story. She calls me back a week later and says, guess what? You got Diane Sawyer I said, oh my God, now we're doing this. Okay, it looks like we're moving forward here. The next thing I thought was well, I wanted to do a print ad and, and I thought, and Alan agreed about doing Vanity Fair. Um, credible magazine, but also a little on the edgy side would do something like this and do it right. And that would come out two months later and he calls me up and he says, and I'm still quote Bruce at the time, he said, okay, you got the cover of Vanity Fair. I'm going, oh, here we go. I had no idea what was going to happen. So I'm sitting in a room when Diane Sawyer's going on. It's ABC News. You don't get a chance to see it beforehand. I'm sitting in the living room, and I got all my kids. Now, this is by far the most social media family in the world on this couch, okay? We can reach about a half a billion people by going like this. Okay, and I got Kendall on one side, Kylie on the other, 
And those are the only two that I'm really, really concerned about. The show goes on. I had not seen it. The show goes on. Within five minutes of the show going on, social media starts going crazy and in a very positive way. I remember Lady Gaga was the first one to tweet something out. And I remember Kendall going, oh my God, Lady Gaga just said, oh, this is the greatest night ever, you know? And then everybody, Elton John, you name it, they just started. It was a flood of positive support. And I'm sitting there on the couch with my kids, and I, I really felt like they thought right at that moment, you know what? It's going to be okay. Dad's going to be okay. And of course, they asked me, what do we call you? And I said, well, I'm your dad, and I'll be your dad till the day I die. I think dad's appropriate, you know, because pronouns within the trans community are very challenging. But for me, I'll be your dad till the day you die, you know. And they're so good at my dad, she. That's tough to do when you start getting pronouns all mixed up. And so I think Kendall especially said, because she called me like three times that night and told me that she loved me, I think we felt it was okay. When Vanity Fair came out, it was like, okay, I'm out there. It just couldn't have been better and a more positive experience. I really, this journey I've been on throughout my life, has been a learning experience. Being part of this wonderful community, the trans community, I had at first a lot to learn. I didn't know about all the issues. I had never met anybody else who was trans, and I'm like, at this point, 65 years old, 64 and a half years old. I had never met anybody else who was trans. So there was a lot of learning to do, a lot of pronouns to learn, a lot of issues. Some of the big issues that we have in our community today are almost overwhelming. We have a suicide rate in our community which is totally out of control, nine times higher than the general public. We have health issues, physical health issues, mental health issues, we have a terrible problem with depression. In the United States, we have a trans woman of color murdered every two weeks to murder. We lose one. There is the dark side to the trans community and the very marginalized side to the trans community. But then on the other hand, I've been blessed to be able to meet some of the greatest people who have been through so much in their lives come out the other side and are just extraordinary human beings. So I try to always figure out, back in the old days when I was giving my speech, I had a way to end it. And at first when I started giving the speech and talking, especially in such a short amount of time, how do I end the speech? I thought, you know what, it still works the way old Bruce ended it in the old days. Because it talks, I want to also put a positive message towards our community. And the way he used to end it, I would always say this. I want to break this down into four words. My four words, keys to success in life. And those four words are this. Gamble, cheat, lie, and steal. Okay. Yeah, best reaction I've gotten from the audience so far. This is scary. You're in the healthcare business. Okay. Gamble, cheat, lie, and steal. My four words, keys to success, because baby, I've been through all of them, okay? Gamble. Gamble your best shot in life. Dare to take risk. Life has got to be a great adventure. Or it's nothing. Cheat. Cheat those who would have you be less than you are. Surround yourself with positive people, uplifting people, people who want to see you do well. Lie. Lie in the arms of those that you love. 
hey, when it comes right down to it, that's all we have is one another. Never take the love that you give or the love that you receive for granted. And finally, steal. Steal every moment of happiness. Live every day as if it was your last because we never know when that day is going to come. I want to thank you for having me here today because health issues in our community are so challenging, so important. And as I said earlier, there are no borders. We're in every country of the world. We're in every society of the world, every color, and diversity is good. We have to celebrate diversity. So I want to thank you very much for having me, and I think we're going to have some questions coming up, but thank you. Okay, nothing too personal, I blush, okay? <laughs> oh my God, I'm gonna oh, rip up no. my... Oh, now we get down to the good juicy gossip stuff. Okay. <laughs> Caitlin, that was fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so it has been an amazing journey and it's not over yet. What would you say you're most proud of? I'm most proud of finally getting to a point in life where I can just get rid of so much stuff in my life. You know, my, my life today, you know, you think of, oh my God, all the issues you have must be so complicated, so different. No, my life today is simple. I get up in the morning and I just be myself all day long. I mean, that was a tough thing to do. I think to be the best person we can be, I, that's, a hard, that's a long journey, but it's a hard one to get to. And for me, that's been by far the best part, mm. is just living my life and, and being in a position where I'm playing in the fourth quarter of life, but being in a position where with a lot of hard work, running all over the world, you can make a difference in life, mm. a, a difference in humanity and bringing this issue, because it's out there. And people have called you brave, and indeed you've won an award for bravery, and, and, and rightly so, but you write in the book, um, which I would encourage people to read, I, I thought it was really a, a fantastic read. You say there's no bravery in becoming your authentic self. It was, a, you say, a form of cowardice to wait so long. Why did you wait so long? What took, what took you so long? Because I had a life to live. I didn't know what to do. See, when I grew up, like, you know, I was born in 1950s, and the 50s and 60s, there was nothing out there. They, they, I didn't even know a word for it. I just kept my mouth shut, uh, went on, and, and I was fortunate. I found sports where I could, I found a place where I could go on the athletic field and outperform the other guy, take a guy who, I was also dyslexic, and take a guy who was a good student, good reader on the football field and clean his clock, you know? And this is what, as you're a young person, that's what you need never knowing how far I would take it. And, um, but eventually, as, after it was all over, then I looked back on that part of my life, I was actually very pleased. Why? Because I was different. Nobody knew it, but I was different than everybody else. So when sports came along, I needed sports more than the next guy. And that same pattern went all the way through my entire career. Um, I had, I had a, more of a reason to be out there and to out-train them and to outwork them and do all that sort of stuff. And then all of a sudden, within a 48-hour period, it was over with. And as I talked to earlier, I, I got scared. Oh my God, what do I do now that I build this character up so big? What do you think your life would have been if your gender dysphoria had been diagnosed when you were younger? I mean, a lot of people um, now, ages of sort of 14, 15, 16, teenagers, uh, older people, it, it, the diagnosis itself or the, the acknowledging of it is a big deal, but if you'd had that younger? Um, every journey is different. I celebrate every journey, but things have changed so drastically, like myself coming out and other people in the community coming out and being public with it. But the, really the big thing that changed everything was the internet. See, when I was growing up, there was no information out there, zero, nothing. There wasn't even a name for it. Today, it's on TV, 
Um, you have uh, the internet out there. All you have to do is just type in transgender and hundreds of thousands of pages of information is immediately at your fingertips. You go on YouTube, thousands of people who have transitioned and it's just so much information. I, I still look at the internet just because I did, the internet for a long time was my only contact with the community. So, and that wasn't for the last few years before I actually transitioned. So the internet really did make a huge difference. Um, and like people like myself and other people in the community, because of our exposure, yes, kids at a younger age are looking at this, okay? Um, I, I honestly, I get almost on a daily basis some parent coming up to me and saying that, you know, my child, six years old, eight years old, 10 years old, and they kind of identify, you know, with gender and, and they're kind of struggling with it and this and that. And the only thing I say to them is provide a loving home. Provide a safe place for your child. The child will figure these things out. But what they need is not be bullied. We have a terrible rate, especially with young people, with suicide. It's nine times higher than the general public. I mean, the list goes on and on and on of all of the issues. But they have to know when they come home, even if they been bullied at school, when they come home, they have a safe place with parents that are understand and are trying to deal with it the best they can, and a safe place where they can be themselves. Do you think there's a, 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 an age that's too, I mean, what, what would you say are the age limits of transition, if you like? What is there, is it, is there, a, there's obviously a too young, but what would be too young, do you think? I mean, for people who are... Well, it depends on your saying physically change. Um, having gender confirmation, things like that, from uh, male to females, things like that. That's really up to a lot of the doctors that are out there. Um, but there are so many things that you can do to live your authentic self um, that uh, a lot of them experiment at very, very young ages. You know, a lot of male to females wear dresses at, you know, eight, nine, ten. I, I don't sleep. I look at it this way, because I, I'm kind of new to this. I look at it as I feel like, now I'm, I'm certainly not a doctor or speaking, but only my own personal uh, thinking about this, is I think like there's intensities of being trans, you know? Um, I see some kids five, six years old that, let's say male to female, you know, mom says, calls you a little boy, oh, mom, you're wrong. You know, like five, six years old, no, I'm a girl. Don't you, don't you know that? I mean, that's pretty intense at a, at a very young age to be that aware of something like that. And then there's people like myself who I found ways to live with it. Uh, I lived a very successful life for many, many years. I found my ways to do it. My intensity wasn't that bad. Although when you read the book, every time I read the first chapter, I cry, I can't help it, I cry. Of all of the things I went through, oh, you know, going on the road and clothes and trying to get through security and you got, you know, male clothes, female clothes, you got all of these things and, you know, sneaking around trying to find 10 minutes where I could be myself, mm. you know? If the good news is I never got caught. <laughs> Never got caught, got pretty good at sneaking around like that, yes. Um, yeah, the media never caught me or anything like that. But, you know, my, yeah, my journey was different. And um, I'm, I'm just so glad it's that, that part of my life is all behind me. And at my age, um, that there's, uh, I love this issue. I love talking about this issue. I love bringing this issue forward. And hopefully in some ways doing a little bit of God's work here, you know, to cre he created us. Um, and bring this, bringing this issue forward to me, uh, honestly, I'm having so, fun with, so much fun with it, I just love it. What do you think of the um, medical and healthcare professionals? Are they, um, in terms of their understanding and acceptance of, of, of transgender issues, are we keeping up or are we lagging behind or? Actually, it's a very good question. Uh, I think the, 
The medical community has come a long way when it comes to this issue, okay? The physical aspects of it, but also the mental side of being trans. Um, we have a terrible problem with depression uh, in our community. When you're going out on the internet or you're in high school and you're different, um, people can be pretty, pretty cruel. Um, I usually say to people like this, I go, can you imagine a world where everybody's the same? <laughs> everybody has the same skin tone, everybody has the same color hair, okay, same gender identity, same sexual orientation, same color of skin, you name it and the list goes on, same shape of eyes, everybody's the same. Wouldn't that be the most boring place in the world, okay? That would be so boring. I mean, I'm like in New York City, and you walk down the street, and you just look at all the other people, the way they dress, the way they look, the way this. It's just wonderful. Diversity is great. We should celebrate that diversity. Yes, everybody else is different. Not condemn somebody else because their eyes may be a different shape or their skin may be a different tone. We are all in this together, and diversity is a good thing. So as far as the medical community, yes, it is really important that we realize that diversity is good, and yes, there are trans people out there, there are people in the LGBT community out there, and everybody needs to be treated equally. Yeah. Um, this, this, one of the themes of this conference, and, and, and every year we talk about wanting to put the patient at the center of healthcare. Um, and one of the themes, we, one of the questions we're learning to ask is, what matters to you? Um, so, what would have made the biggest difference in your healthcare journey, uh, do you think? What, what would have Ooh. been the thing you would have liked to have well, seen okay. for you? First of all, <clears throat> I am the exception to the rule. I am not even close to being the rule, in, and especially in our community. I, I've always had a job, I've always had healthcare. Um, I've had these things. I've been very blessed in so many ways because of that, but that is not the norm in our community. Our community is a very marginalized community, and when you think about healthcare for the entire community, um, it is so difficult for so many people. Hormones, uh, if you have any physical things that you need to do to be able to live your life authentically, those are issues that are huge in the community. Um, I am very fortunate in so many ways uh, because of my position that I started, uh, I originally did a deal with MAC when I first came out with cosmetics and doing a lipstick line. And we were able to give away um, to the MAC AIDS Fund Transgender Initiative um, about $2 million over the last year and a half uh, to organizations, trans organizations around the world, because again, this is a global issue. Um, uh, since then, I decided to start my own foundation, because I thought, I want that money to go where I want it to go. So we started the Caitlyn Jenner Foundation. Uh, we've been able to be very successful in raising money. We're starting right now, particularly in the Los Angeles area, because that's where I live, and I know the communities that are there, to try to give money. One of the things, because everything in the trans community is underfunded, um, one of the organizations that I work with is St. John's Hospital. They have a separate division, LGBT Center, and they deal with trans issues. They service about 3,000 trans people in the Los Angeles area. The trans community, there's a lot of trans people in LA, uh, just because of the weather and a lot of immigrants there because they've been persecuted in other parts of the world that they flee to the United States. Um, but I've, uh, every over the last few years, I've been able to donate quite a bit of money to them to help with hormone. They do everything. They do dental care. They, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Great organization doing great, uh, great stuff for the community. But those types of uh, organizations are few and far between mm -hmm. that are actually centered on trans people. So we've got a long way to go, um, but what, hopefully what, we can get there. So, so for the, what would you think of the kind of the, the really big obstacles or the barriers for the transgender community to access healthcare? I mean, you, you as you've 
say, have had many advantages. You've had a job, you've had financial resources, you've had, you know, white right. male privilege, ironically, all, all of that. What, what do you think that the health care, I mean, globally the big issue, but, but let's say in the developed world, um, are the big challenges for transgender provision of health care? Yeah. Well, the first thing I think what the healthcare community needs to understand is the trans issue is out there. There are trans people everywhere. You know, a lot of times we don't even know they're trans. Um, and uh, first of all, recognizing that this is a, an issue in your community, in your country. Uh, it's not going away. We're going to be there. Trans people are going to be around. It's just part of, a, fortunately, a small part, but it is a part of humanity. Just the recognizing of that. These people aren't crazy. They just need some help from physical help, hormones, things like that, but then also to mental health, to be able to get through it. 25% um, of all trans people are HIV positive. Really scary. I didn't know that. The sex work business, as we call them in the community, survival crimes, is huge. Um, because, especially like in the Los Angeles, I, I hosted this movie that they had just done called Tangerine. It was about the black community, trans women in the sex business. And we call it a survival crime. I mean, that's, they, that mean, they can't get a crime? job. They can't find a job. A lot of them are undocumented, don't have a social security number. What are they going to do? They can't get a job, or they have a hard time getting the job. But unfortunately, the sex work business, I've heard 25% of all prostitutes are trans women. Now, and they also have to have their old parts. They get the new parts, they're like any other girl. Okay, so there's a, a section of our male community out there that I guess is into that. And so trans women are lured into that uh, because it's good money, it's quick, it's cash, let's go. But because of that, um, we lose a lot of trans women. Mm -hmm. uh, like I was saying earlier, trans women of color, um, yeah, we lose one every two weeks to murder. Um, and that's just a shame. Mm -hmm. So that, with that comes, we need jobs, we need equality in jobs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we need to be able to get these people some good, honest work and uh, get them off the streets. Yeah. You, yeah. Men you mentioned the issue of language, and it may seem a trivial point, but I, I mean, I know when I was talking to people saying I was going to be doing these interv this interview, uh, the issue about pronouns and, um, you know, oh. <laughs> Uh, how much, uh, why, why can't we just invent a non-gendered pronoun? I don't know if there's any language in the world that has non-gendered pronoun. It just seems to me to be a, um, oh look, there's some people putting their hands up. What language is that? Swedish, you see the Swedes are so grown up. Icelandic, Icelandic. Yeah. We need to hear. No, more. they have, uh, I was with uh, Jill Soloway, Jill Soloway the other day, uh, who is the producer for Transparent. And she finally just came out as kind of gender non-conforming, this and that. And I says, well, what's the pronoun? Because, and she goes, them. Yeah. And I started thinking, wait a second. OK, how do I use that in a sense? Yeah. yeah, it was kind of tough to do. Pronouns for the community is very important. I've always been a little soft on pronouns. I, I was old Bruce for a long time, and people are going to mess up, and I don't. I, Care, you know, to be honest with you, but I got in trouble with the community, like you've got to get the pronouns right. <laughs> um, and I tried my best, and, and still, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of and, tough. And also the, the parent, I mean, the dad-mum thing, I mean, it'd be nice to have a non-gendered parent pronoun, but a parent, uh, you know, name. Yeah, maybe, maybe and that's like, uh, there, oh yeah, well, um, well, my one granddaughter calls me Boom Boom. Yeah, we try to... <laughs> uh, yeah, they've all tried to come up with creative ways to be able to deal with it. But to be honest with you, I really, it was mostly my kids. And, and I, for me, I'm not like everybody else, but for me, I'm their dad. Yeah, I've been their yeah. dad their whole life. Yeah. And I'm going to die their dad. And, you know, but they're good at my dad, she. 
I was really impressed with that, <laughs> yeah, Kendall. And my mother, who was 89 when I transitioned it and knew nothing about it my entire life. This came out of left field. Uh, she's been brilliant. Mom's been great. And she's just never messes up, gets the pronouns right, and that's <laughs> difficult. The one thing for me that is by far the most difficult is uh, my father, uh, who passed away way before all of this. Uh, my dad was a World War II veteran, uh, fifth range of battalion, landed on Omaha Beach. Uh, war veteran, buried at Arlington. In fact, I was there just a couple of weeks ago and, and visited his grave site. Um, and I just wonder, it's always, that's why in the book I dedicate it to my father and my brother who was killed in a car accident when he was 18, which were the two members of my family who never got an opportunity to hear this story. Mm. And I wonder about my dad and how he would have taken it. I, I think at first he would have <laughs> gone because he was at both Olympics, saw me win, was so proud of me and all that type of stuff. I think at first he would have gone, snap out of it, you know, <laughs> are you kidding me? What? He couldn't have dealt with it. But then as I think as time went on, he tried to see a lot of the things that I'm doing and how I'm trying to bring this issue forward so other people don't have to deal with the, the harsh reality of it. Um, and I think eventually he would have come around and been pretty proud of it. Yeah. So coming out as, as transgender is, is obviously a big deal for the individual. It's a big deal for the family. And you have a more extended family than, than most. And, and you've written about the, the, the problems of that. And you've told us about that. And some of the estrangements that happen and, you know, the toing and froing. But what would you say to, to family members who are struggling to come to terms with someone they love um, who's telling them that they are transgender? I was doing an interview one time, and this guy asked me, he goes, what would you say to Kendall if she came out as being trans and was going to transition into a guy? <laughs> I just went, whoa, hold it, my gorgeous little Kendall. I mean, she last year became the highest paid model in the world. She's just such a good kid. I just love her to death and just love her that she was trans. And it just hit me as a parent. First, the struggle, how difficult it would be in the struggle. It would have been so difficult. Would I, would I have stood in her way? Absolutely not. I wouldn't have stood in her way because I understand the issue. But it would have been very difficult for me as a parent. So I can identify with the parents that are out there. Um, and uh, you know, they gave birth to this little child male or female, whatever it is, and it's, a str it's tough and because you want to protect your children. You want to make sure that they're safe, but you also want to make sure they're happy. The only thing I can do as a person, as a trans woman, is try to set a good example. I do that on a daily basis. I'm always trying to be as nice as I can to people. I figure 90% of the people I meet don't know or never met anybody who was trans, take the picture with them, make it a joyous experience to meet us. Because to be honest with you, I have met, although we have all our challenges, I have met some of the most amazing people that are out there, that trans women, trans men who have built tremendous companies, have done tremendous things in their lives. We don't see that side of it very much, who are executives with major corporations, and on and on and on. Um, but I want it to be a positive experience to, to meet somebody. Where is Bruce Jenner now? Bruce Jenner lives inside. You know, everybody thinks he goes through something like this, that all of a sudden you become a different human being. Wrong. I'm still in so many ways the same way. I'm very comfortable with myself. I thought right at that moment when I finally decided that, okay, I'm going to do this, it was very simple. Bruce had been out there for almost 65 years doing his thing. Bruce just did about everything he could do. He had raised wonderful children. He won the games. You know, he was a good parent. He always worked hard. He's on and on and on. Great. You know, did everything. And little Caitlin had always lived inside, sneaking around, you know. 
not knowing anybody, so nobody knows what's going on. And I thought to myself when I had the, kind of that conversation with myself, with my pastor, I thought maybe it's her turn. Maybe let's just see, and playing in the fourth quarter of life, let's just see what she can do. See how she done. Bruce did everything. So let's take little Bruce, who everybody knows, stick him inside, and let's let Caitlin live. And so that's as simple as I did it. But Bruce is still in there. Um, I've always been involved in aviation. I still fly airplanes. I got my own plane. I fly everywhere I want to go. Um, Bruce used to race cars. And at first you think, oh, I got to give all that up. Heck with that. Racing cars was fun, you know? And uh, <laughs> why not? So I thought, girls can do this too, you know? And so a lot of the things that Bruce, when I have some very good friends in my life, and they all say the exact same thing, you know, uh, yeah, Bruce is still around. Yeah, we still see that. And I've had friends, uh, I don't know if you know Jay Leno. Jay Leno's a good friend, comedy, comedy guy. Every time I see him, he's a big car guy. And every time I see him, he goes, you haven't changed a bit. You look bad, you know, but you haven't really changed. <laughs> and I said, I totally agree with you, you know. Um, yeah, I'm just living my life authentically. That's all. So, uh, yeah, Bruce is still around. Yeah, I don't talk about it that much. <laughs> Caitlin's a lot more fun. <laughs> Actually, I went to my first, my uh, daughter-in-law is getting married to my son Brody, and I went to my first uh, bridal shower. It was so much more fun than the bachelor party, okay? <laughs> so, so, yeah. So it's much more fun on this side. So, you know, <laughs> thanks for having me on your team, girls. Yeah. So, Kate, and you're going, um, you're, you're here, obviously, in Amsterdam. Fantastic. You're going to London, I think, next? Are yes, yeah, we go to London. What, what you, uh, what doing a, a little speech on um, equality in the workplace. So what are you hoping to, to achieve by, in your London trip? Honestly, um, again, helping bring this issue forward, being visible, bring this issue forward. Because in me doing that, it makes it easier for the younger people down here, you know? Um, what I always say is uh, I've been very blessed because of all the things that I've been able to do in my life is to have a platform. Now, sometimes I've been very criticized for having a platform and what you do, especially at the beginning, but I'm slowly working into how do I do this? You know, I'm in a position where my platform, I can raise money, I can talk to CEOs of companies, you name it. Uh, because of that, I can go out and give money. And But what I want all, every person who's suffering with a lot of these are suffering or dealing, I don't want to say suffering, because nobody's dealing with a lot of these issues, to use their platform, mm. uh, to be out there, to be visible. Mm. I donate money to the, um, the LA Trans Choir. There's like 40, sometimes 50 of them, okay? And we have this LA Trans Choir. And it's like when the curtains open up, a, a cis person, I don't know, you would be a cis person. Okay. You were born this way, girl? I was born this way, girl. Okay, yeah, then that's, I think it's the Latin word. I, I always have to ask. Uh, it's, I think it's the Latin word for the same. You kind of group yeah. trans, like a transatlantic flight. You go from one place to another. So that's kind of where the vocabulary comes from. But, uh, yeah, other trans women, they have a platform, too. Yeah. And I want everybody to be able to use their platform. Mm -hmm. Um, to be able to move this issue forward. Um, and so, yeah, and so when I go to London, I'm going to do a television show. I hear that there are some people on there that are not very happy with our community. I'm going, oh, and, and actually got some letters from people in uh, the London area uh, saying I shouldn't do it because of these people. Glad, who is the media, the guy named Nick Adams is the head of all trans issues, uh, said, I don't want you to talk to Pierce Morgan. And I did that interview six months ago. You did. It was a very combative. I thought it was quite combative that this isn't quite so combative, is it? Because this is this is wonderful. <laughs> You're so much nicer than Pierce. I'm glad to hear okay? that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. This is so much nicer. But. But uh, the, Nick Adams from Glad says, ah, I don't think you should do that. You know, he kind of messed it up with Janet Mock and, you know, just doesn't, doesn't get, get it. Me, I said, that's the ones that's I want to talk to. 
Okay, and I even told Pierce at the beginning, I said, Pierce, this is gonna be an educational moment for you. I'm not gonna be, <laughs> I'm not gonna be easy on you. You mess up, I'm gonna tell you, okay? And try to straighten you out and give you a hand. And I've had so many people since that interview, even the flight attendant coming over here for British Airlines, she goes, oh my God, I just love the interview that you did with Pierce. You just told that guy. <laughs> and I go, yeah, yeah. And so anyway, um, uh, this thing, uh, this week, yeah, I, you know, I'll go on with the people that are in favor of the community, but also the other people that are not. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm kind of looking forward to it. Yeah. I'm ready. Yeah. A final word to, to, to the people in this audience. I mean, many of them, most of them, perhaps all of them have a platform. All of us here have a platform. Right. Um, but, but some of us may be afraid to use it in the ways that we should. And what would you say to, to us here who, who might not, you know, might have an opportunity to say something important, not, not necessarily about trans issues, but about the issue of importance to them? Yeah, um, everybody has stuff. Everybody has things in their lives that they're dealing with, okay? Um, in our journey in life, it's about how we deal with them. To, uh, I'm, a good example of I've dealt with so many issues in my life and my life is so much more simpler today because I'm dealing with those things. Um, in some ways it's more complicated, but in most cases, as long as my soul is free, I feel, I feel good and I'm heading in the right direction. Um, we have to take care of ourselves first, most important thing. Um, when it comes to issues, uh, be able to deal with them in a, in a respectful and being showing great tact in how you handle this type of stuff, um, trying not to offend people, but then also trying to live yourself the best way you possibly can. And when you put your head in the pillow at night, knowing that I did a good job today. I felt good about the things I did. Maybe everybody didn't agree, but for me it was the right thing to do. Um, there is change, especially you look in our community, in the trans community in the last 15 years, the amount of change that we have been able to go through. Do we still have a lot of work? Yeah. Um, but we've been able to make great strides because of people using their platforms um, to bring this issue forward. Trans communities out there, you know, let's do the best job we possibly can because, you know, we only get one shot at this thing called life. We do. Yeah. Caitlin Jenner, thank you so much for coming to talk to us. Ladies and gentlemen, Caitlin Jenner. Thank you. Caitlin, thank, thank you so much. Pleasure, really good. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. It's a pleasure. Really good. Good job. I think we're going to go off that. I think I am too. Thank you so much indeed. Good job. <laughs>